Cork City is Ireland's third largest city and has always been an important seaport. It is located in a valley and surrounded by many hills. The city began as a small monastery on an island in the swampy estuary of the River Lee and gradually climbed up steep banks on either side to become the city we know and love today. Cork is located at the estuary of the River Lee, which flows through Cork City in two main channels, explaining the presence of water and bridges in the city centre. The city is often called Rebel Cork because it was a centre for the 19th century Fenian movement and played an active part in the Irish struggle for independence and also for the fact that its citizens strive to portray the city as the unofficial or real capital of Ireland. Through the years Cork has provided some of Ireland's finest sportsmen and women, with its hurling and football teams having a long tradition of doing well in All-Ireland Finals. Cork also boasts the home of the late great musician Rory Gallagher, and a monument to him can be seen in the city centre. Modern day Cork is a lively, friendly city that continues to expand and develop, combining small town intimacy with the energy and vitality of modern city life. The city's narrow alleys, waterways and Georgian architecture give it a distinctly continental feel. A stroll down the main street, St. Patrick Street, gives the visitor a clear view of the fine pubs, restaurants, cafes and the beautiful atmosphere that the city has to offer.
Cork is also seen as a city enthusiastic for the arts and crafts. Music, theatre, dance and film all play a prominent role in city life. There are many theatres and galleries. The most notable of these are the Crawford Municipal Art Gallery, the Opera House and the Triscoll Art Centre. The Cork Jazz Festival is renowned not only in Ireland, but also throughout Europe, with many of the world's top jazz musicians coming to play in the city on the October Bank Holiday weekend each year. Let us now take a more in-depth view of the history, starting with the origins of the city itself. Cork originated as a monastic settlement dating back to 600 AD. Legend has it that a monk called Finbar travelled from Gugombara in the Sheehy Mountains to find a new site for his expanding monastery. He came across an area now dominated by St Finbar's Cathedral, or as some historians would argue, a little to the west of the cathedral. At this time Cork looked very different, and the monastery would have been located on a cliffside overlooking a series of marshy islands, which were collectively known as Corkic Moor na Mamon, or in English, the Great Marsh of Munster. Today these islands are buried underneath the city centre, from around 600 to 800 AD, the monastery is believed to have flourished, and like other monasteries in Ireland, it became very wealthy. This wealth became very attractive to the Norwegian Vikings who invaded Ireland. It is believed that the monastery was first attacked in 820, and was subsequently plundered many times in the following hundred years. In addition to plundering the monastery, the Vikings also established their own settlement on a location around Cork at Moor and Mohon. Most historians believe that this settlement was located on a marshy island, now occupied by the site of the Beamish and Crawford Brewery across the river. The invasion of the Danish Vikings in 914 AD led to further expansion of this area. In 1177 the arrival of the Anglo-Normans led to further developments in the emerging central Cork area, and this was when the name of the city evolved closer to what we know it as today. This is because the name Corkig Moor na Mumhon was shortened to Cork. The Anglo-Normans also created a new walled town on the site that had been inhabited by the Danish Viking settlement. In the early 1300s, the walled town was extended to encompass other marshy areas. The city continued to progress slowly in the following years, until the 1700s when a more marked expansion took place. The 1700s saw the construction of numerous houses, streets and quays on the marshes, with a number of bridges built to connect the quays to the surrounding hills. In 1750, the population had grown so much that a commission was set up to deal with the ensuing health problems of ad hoc development. This commission, which became known as the Wide Street Commission, oversaw the widening of laneways, alleviating some of the health problems attached to narrow streets and sewers. By the late 1700s, Cork Corporation decided to fill most of the channels in the city centre.
Cork has continued to develop over the last few years and has become a large progressive city today, steeped in history and culture. Indeed, there are some fascinating historic buildings around the city that we should now turn our attention to. Arguably the most famous building of the mall in Cork is St Anne's Church Shandon. The present church at Shandon, St Anne's Church, was erected in 1722 to replace the older church of St Mary's, which was destroyed in the Siege of Cork. The church is built from red sandstone and grey limestone, which gives it a unique look. The walls of this building are 7 feet thick, and the building is approximately 170 feet high. The terrace tower at the top of the building is crowned in the form of a salmon 11 foot 3 inches in length. Natives of Cork affectionately call this figure the Goldie Fish, and because of its shape, the church tower is known as the Pepper Box. In 1750, the firm of Abel Rudhall in Gloucestershire cast the famous bells of Shandon, and two years later they were installed in the tower. The bells weigh almost six tons and were first heard on the 7th of December 1752 to announce the marriage of a Mr. Henry Harding to Miss Catherine Dorman. Each of the eight bells has its own inscription, one of which says, Abel Rudhall of Gloucestershire made us all. The tower connects four great clocks, which were made by James Mangan, a local watch and clockmaker. Each clock is 14 foot in diameter. Mangan made several other notable clocks throughout Munster, including the ornate clock on Patrick Street, outside the entrance to Merchant's Key Shopping Centre. A walk up the 100 steps to the clock machinery section onto the bell tower is strongly recommended. Indeed, the visitor can also avail of the opportunity to play various tunes on the bells. To the natives of Cork, the clock is known as the four-faced liar, because each clock face runs at a slightly different time to that of its three companions. A mere stone's throw from St Anne's Church Shandon is the famous butter market. By the mid-1700s, the butter industry in Cork had grown to such an extent that a decision was taken to establish an institution to control and develop its potential. It is for this reason that a committee of butter merchants was set up, and in 1769 the committee of butter merchants first began their work. The committee resided in a purpose-built building across from Shandon. In the spring of 1770, it was decreed by the committee that all butter to be exported from Cork should be examined by appointed inspectors. The inspectors were employed to determine the quality of the butter, the manner of packing, and to ensure that no fraud took place. The inspectors examined each cask, commonly known as friskin, and graded the butter in accordance with their findings. The grades ranged from 1 to 6, with 1 being top grade of butter, and 6 being the lowest grade of butter. With the expansion in the butter trade came the need to enlarge the building, and the developer, Sir John Benson, carried out this enlargement between 1850 and 1860. The market soon became one of the most important butter markets in the British Isles. Farmers came from all over Cork and Kerry to deliver their butter. Unfortunately, towards the end of the 19th century, the Cork butter industry came under severe pressure from France and Scandinavia so much so that the old market closed in 1925. In the 1980s, the building was beautifully restored, and a craft centre opened up within, which has now become one of the main tourist attractions in Cork City. The Cork City Jail in the Sunday's Well area of Cork was designed to replace the old jail at the North Gate Bridge in the city. The old prison was nearly 100 years old, 
and had become overcrowded and outdated. The building of the new jail commenced in 1821, with Sir Thomas Dean as the chief architect and Richard Natter as chief developer. The raw material used for the jail was locally quarried sandstone. The building was a three-storey complex with up to 150 cells and it was built in a Georgian Gothic style. Indeed, the jail is thought to look more like a castle than a place of capture and despair. The new Cork City Jail opened in 1824, and some four years later, the first public execution took place outside the main gate when one Mr. Owen Ryan was hanged outside the doorway. Both male and female prisoners were housed in the building. Male prisoners held in the West Wing and female prisoners in the East Wing. In 1878 it became an all-women's jail and male prisoners were now held in the county jail. In the early 1920s the jail was used to hold IRA members. The prison closed in August 1923 with all remaining prisoners either released or transferred to other jails. From 1927 to 1958 the jail was the broadcast centre for Cork Radio and was later used as a training centre for the Department of Posts and Telegraphs. It reopened to the public in 1993 as a visitor attraction and a heritage site. The site of St Finbar's Cathedral has been a place of worship since the early 7th century. Little is known of the early churches that stood in the site prior to the 12th century. The present-day cathedral is the third to stand on this site, before which a medieval Norman and neoclassical building stood on roughly the same ground. The first was demolished in 1735, after sustaining massive damage during the Siege of Cork. The second was demolished in 1865 to make way for a much more elaborate cathedral. William Burgess designed the present-day St Finbar's Cathedral after winning a competition for which there were 63 entries. The foundation stone was laid on January 1865 and the cathedral was consecrated on November 30, 1870. Burgess not only designed the cathedral, but while he was alive he also took a hands-on approach and supervised the building of every detail, including the construction of the stonework, glasswork, metalwork and woodwork. It was originally envisaged that the church would cost approximately £15,000. However, after the elaborate towers and spires were finally completed, the costs had risen to over £100,000. Today one can tour the church for a nominal entry fee. The Holy Trinity Church a result of the vision of Father Theobald Matthew, is to be found on Father Matthew Key. The Holy Trinity Church was built in 1829 because the little chapel on Blackmore Lane where Father Matthew's congregation met had become too small, hence it was decided to build a bigger church. George Richard Payne, who laid the foundation stone on October 10th, 1832, but was to die a few short years later, designed the church. The church took some 18 years to complete, and a number of different architects worked on the project. The English market is one of Cork's most famous attractions, with an array of butchers and shopkeepers selling some of the finest foods to be found in the whole of Cork. It is located in the heart of Cork City, with entrances on Princess Street, Patrick Street and Grand Parade. The present market was established in the late 18th century and was designed by Sir John Benson. The name English Market is believed to be derived from the fact that in the early days of the market only those of English extraction were allowed to sell their goods there. A fire almost completely destroyed the market on the 19th of June 1980. After the fire, Cork Corporation began rebuilding it and went to great lengths to preserve as much of the original design as possible. The market is very popular among visitors and is a truly unique shopping experience.
The North Cathedral, which was completed in 1808, was the vision of Bishop Francis Moylan, who was Bishop of Cork from 1787 to 1815. The cathedral was first blessed on 22nd of August, 1808. On Pope's Quay, just a stone's throw from Patrick Street, stands the splendid Dominican Church, which is dedicated to St Mary. The Dominicans have been associated with Cork since the 13th century, when they built their abbey and crosses green, which was formerly known as Holy Cross. It was not, however, until the 1830s that this magnificent church was constructed after it became apparent that the Friars' Church would not cater for the steadily increasing population in the area. The original City Hall was built in 1833 as a corn market to cope with the large amount of exported corn business in Cork in the 1820s. This building was converted into a City Hall in 1890 where it stood until it was burnt down by British forces in 1920. Architects Jones and Kelly designed the present day building which was officially opened by President Eamon de Valera on September 8th, 1936. The limestone used for constructing this building, as for so many of Cork's buildings, is from nearby Little Island. Today the City Hall is the headquarters of Cork Corporation and City Administration. Inside the building there is a wonderful concert hall that has a capacity to cater for 1,300 visitors and which serves as a venue for concerts and various official functions. In line with the movement away from the old style castle towards the star shaped fort as the best structure of defence, Queen Elizabeth ordered the construction of a number of star shaped forts in Ireland in the late 16th century, one of which was constructed in Cork City just outside Southgate Drawbridge. The fort was to be known as Elizabeth Fort, a name that has remained until today. The fort was first garrisoned in October of 1602 and soon after came under attack where it was almost destroyed in 1603 by citizens of Cork in an act of defiance against King James I. After the English regained control of the fort, Lord Mountjoy soon ordered it to be rebuilt. Since 1690, it has been used as a prison and a barracks, and is today used as a police station. University College Cork was first established as Queen's College in 1845 and is one of Ireland's oldest universities. Two other Queen's universities were also established in Galway and Belfast at this time. The site for University College Cork was chosen on the southwestern side of the city as it is very close to the area where St Finbar was thought to have founded his monastery and place of learning in Cork. It is for this reason that the university has the motto, where Finbar taught, let Munster learn. Student life at University College Cork is exciting, with over 100 student clubs and societies. The university also boasts the Mardag Sports Centre, a state-of-the-art sports facility, which offers a vast range of sporting amenities.
Red Abbey Tower, situated just off Sullivan's Quay, is the oldest piece of architecture surviving in the city, dating back to the 15th century. Although the abbey itself dates further back to the time when the Augustinians first arrived in Cork in the 13th century, after taking up an invitation by the Anglo-Normans. It is not known why the abbey is called Red Abbey, however, the general consensus is that some of the abbey buildings may have once been made from red sandstone. The monks were based in the abbey for centuries, until they were expelled during the reign of King Henry VIII, who ordered the closure of Red Abbey. The building was later used as a sugar refinery, which was almost completely destroyed by a fire in 1799. Today the building is little more than a ruin, with all that remains, a burnt out tower. Blarney is a world renowned tourist destination, and is rarely missed by those visiting the southwest of Ireland. The town is located about 7 kilometres northwest of Cork City on the banks of the Shorno River. The town is set in beautiful wooded countryside, with magnificent sites situated within a short walk of the centre of the village. The name Blarney is taken from the Gaelic word Blar, which means open field. One of the most visited sites in Cork is Blarney Castle. The castle itself for the most part is in ruin, outside of the grounds around the castle which are well kept and very beautiful. The castle stands on the extensive lands of Blarney Castle Estate, which consists of over 1,000 acres, of which 700 acres have been planted for forestry purposes. Blarney Castle, as we know it today, is the third to have been erected on this site. The first building in the 10th century was a wooden structure, which about 200 years later, this was replaced by a permanent stone structure. In 1446, the third castle on the site was built by Dermot McCarthy, King of Munster. It is strongly recommended that one climbs the steep and narrow spiral staircases to the top of the castle, where one may kiss the famous Blarney Stone, known as the Stone of Eloquence. The stone is traditionally believed to have the power to bestow the gift of eloquence on all those who kiss it. To kiss the Blarney Stone, you must bend over backward and lower yourself down about two feet, holding on to an iron railing. The building of Church of Ireland Parish Church was completed in 1775 and part of the cost was subscribed by Sir John Jeffreys, the then owner of Blarney Castle, who did much good work to develop the town. The church is built in a classical style to resemble a Greek temple style temple. The present Catholic church in the village was officially opened on the 21st of October 1894. Prior to the opening of this church, the parishioners in the Blarney area had to undertake a two mile walk to the nearest Catholic church at Waterloo. The church has a nave some 120 foot long and 22 foot wide, with side aisles and sacristy. The Blarney woollen mills were developed by the Mahoney family in 1824, and despite some setbacks including a fire, which for the most part destroyed the building, grew up to the point where it employed some 700 people by 1950. Unfortunately the life was to go into decline thereafter, and eventually the mills closed in 1975 due to a recession in the textile industry. In 1976 the mill was bought by Christy Kelleher who had himself been a mill worker, and over time he transformed the mill into a gift and craft retail centre and also a restaurant. Cove is situated on Great Island, one of the three major islands in Cork Harbour. The others are Little Island and Photo Island. 
They are now linked by roads and bridges. It is spelt C O B H, as this is the Irish language version of its original name under British rule. In 1849, Queen Victoria landed here, and in honour of the event, its name was changed to Queenstown. In 1922, after the establishment of the Republic, it was renamed Cove. St. Coleman's Cathedral stands majestically overlooking the town. It is built in French Gothic style. The exterior is of dolky granite, with dressings of mellow limestone. It took 47 years to build, from 1868 to 1915, at a cost of £235,000, with which £90,000 was raised by the people of Cove. Very substantial amounts were raised in America and Australia, the remainder from the diocese. It now has 49 bells, which are tuned to the accuracy of a single vibration. Cove has a fascinating history some of which can be experienced in the Heritage Centre on the site of the old railway station on the waterfront. There, with the help of sound effects, you can mingle with the crowds on the quayside, with families who are leaving a life of poverty and starvation, in the hope of finding something better in an unknown country far away. You can sail with them and see and hear the wind and the water lashing the decks in the Atlantic gale. Outside the Heritage Centre on the quay is a statue of Annie Moore and her two brothers. Annie was the first emigrant to set foot on Ellis Island. The statue was created by Jean Reinhardt and unveiled by President Mary Robinson on the 9th of February 1993 as a tribute to the immigrants who left Ireland for the New World. There is a similar statue of Annie in Ellis Island, New York, alone, holding a small suitcase. She stands as a symbol of the many Irish who passed that way during the tough famine years in Ireland. In 1846 total disaster happened in Ireland when the potato crop failed completely. In the years 1847 to 1849 there was a famine on a scale now unimaginable to us. The Irish people relied on potatoes virtually completely for subsistence. Suddenly there were no potatoes at all. All potato stocks had rotted and the new crop was found to be already rotting by the time it was harvested. In the six years after 1845 to 1851, over one and a half million people emigrated, about 700 per day on average. The majority departed from Cove. Before the famine, many ships left with cargoes of convicts. Their crimes varied from sheep stealing to involvement in revolutionary activities against British rule. Between 1791 and 1853, 30,000 men and 9,000 women were transported as prisoners to Australia. On the 11th of April 1912, 123 passengers boarded the Titanic at Cove. Cove was its last port of call on its maiden voyage from Southampton to New York. The ship was too big to get into the inner harbour, so it anchored off Roaches Point. About 14,000 people were on board as it left Cove, mercifully unaware of the nightmare that awaited them. Few survived the journey. During World War I, Cove served as a base for destroyers, 
anti-submarine patrols, seaplanes and convoys, and thousands of military personnel were based in the nearby forts. On May the 7th, 1915, the Cunard liner Lusitania was on its way from New York to Liverpool when it was struck by a torpedo from a German submarine just 10 miles off the old head of Kinsale. It sank in about 20 minutes with the loss of nearly 1,200 lives. 761 people were rescued and ferried to Cove and Kinsale. Three days later, 150 of the recovered bodies were buried outside Cove. It is claimed that the Lusitania was carrying munitions as well as passengers. This could explain why it was torpedoed and why it sank so fast. Many Americans were among the dead. This was a contributing factor to America joining the war. In the years following Irish independence, Cove suffered greatly as a result of development of air travel and as more and more people turned to planes rather than ships, less and less large transatlantic liners called to Cove, its prosperity declined. A large increase in immigration from the town followed, however, thanks to local effort and tourism. It is again beginning to flourish. The establishment of the cross-channel ferry route from Cove to Passage West has greatly helped. This has put it within easy reach of Kinsale and West Cork, and also to the ferry port for Britain and continental Europe. We hope that this short film will have given the viewer a great understanding of what it is that makes Cork City, Blarney and Cove such wonderfully intriguing and fascinating places. With so much history, culture and scenic beauty, it is no wonder that Cork is sometimes affectionately known as the real capital of Ireland. <laughs>